What's up YouTube? Welcome back to the Crypto Breakdown Layer 1 Whiteboard Mini Series. In today's video, I'm going to teach you everything you know about the Hedera Hashgraph, aka HBAR. But before we dive in, I want to give a special shout out to everyone who has subscribed to this channel. We just broke 90,000 subscribers and big shout out to every one of my members and everyone on this list. Y'all mean the world to me and I couldn't have done it without y'all. But I gotta let you in on a little secret. This video is for educational and entertainment purposes only. Nothing stated in this video is a fact. I am not a financial advisor and this video is not investing advice. Links to all of my research and articles are down in the description. So if y'all ready, let's kick things off with what is HBAR, then we'll talk about tokenomics, VCs, validator rewards, and we'll make some 2023 and 2025 price predictions. Okay, scrap that. HBAR sucks, guys. I'm sorry. It's hands down my least favorite crypto. Oh man, I'm on fire today. So instead of wasting your time and mine, let me just explain all of the reasons why I think HBAR sucks and I think it's a horrible investment. Then we'll make some price predictions at the end of the video. Let's start with the fact that HBAR is a DAG. It is not a blockchain, which means that there is no linking of blocks. Let's swing over to Radix DLT and take a look at an article called Why DAGs Can't Scale Without Centralization vulnerability. Furthermore, as opposed to blockchains like Bitcoin, where blocks are being mined continuously in unison by miners, with a DAG, hashing only happens when processing new transactions. Malicious actors only need to gain over 33% of the total hash power to attack the network. And that's even before it's sharded. And the lack of constant mining, we can use IOTA for example, where IOTA is only processing between 1.2 and 2.4 TPS and a vast majority of those are empty transactions. The minimal level of transactions makes it vulnerable to attack, which means that the IOTA Foundation or the IOTA team, they are creating fake transactions because the network will be very, very vulnerable if there are not enough transactions taking place. So when the team fails to gain adoption, the network starts to fall apart. So they put validators in place that just send fake transactions to keep the network from being attacked. It's pretty crazy. Secondly, there is otherwise no verifiable guaranteed list of transactions in any timestamped order. Unlike blockchains, which have block slash verifiable timestamps at the time of block creation, DAGs do not have a guaranteed secure timestamp or as latency transaction execution times will vary across nodes. This causes issues not just for the double spend, but also for any application built on the DAG that requires an exact timestamp. As it is, decentralized security is being traded for performance. Now let's talk about the long-term viability. At present, the only way for a DAG to guarantee against a double spend and a 34% attack is with the aid of a centralized authority. Byteball, for example, another DAG, has 12 witness nodes. IOTA has the coordinator. These are centralized validators that dictate how the network runs. These type of tools mean that the network is not censorship resistant. And should any centralized authority be compromised, the network would be vulnerable to attacks from a centralized state itself. These quote unquote centralized states are meant to be temporary states for the network in its infancy. But so far, there is no proof that they have any means of leaving these centralized states behind. Their presence alone calls into question the long-term viability of the system. Stupid, 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 stupid. So what does that mean in layman terms? Number one, we saw the SEC start attacking Ethereum. What they are doing is they are forcing validators to censor transactions. Because there is a centralized point of failure, the SEC can force the team. They can put in a rule that says, hey, your validators have to be penalized by slashing if they process any transactions from Tornado Cash, or maybe they don't like Russia, or maybe they don't like somebody else. Because there is that centralized party that a government can hold accountable, they can force them to censor transactions, which is a complete dumpster fire in itself. Number two, DAGs can't scale. It's just a mathematical fact. The more that they scale, the less secure the network becomes. And at some point they will hit critical failure where they have to be 100% centralized to secure the network. And last but not least, every time a DAG starts to scale, the more that it scales, the higher probability it is that double spend transactions will start to occur. Mathematically, you can't pinpoint the exact point that it'll happen, but it is guaranteed to happen at some point, which all boils back down to the only way to scale a DAG is by extreme centralization. 
Now let's dive into the next dumpster fire that is HBAR. If we swing over to Reddit, I found this post by SecondWind1016 who asked, is there any reason why I should not invest in HBAR? Corsair replies, Swirled only guaranteed an exclusive license to Hedera for the public ledger. Private companies, aka central banks, ETC, can license the hash graph separately and directly from Swirled, which will not add any benefit to HBAR's ecosystem. So I opened up this link to HBAR's governance website and the article reads, yes, although parties originally entered into a non-exclusive license, the parties have recently reached an agreement on such terms. Accordingly, Hedera and Swirled have entered into an amended and restated master license agreement, AKA the MLA, by which Swirled has granted to Hedera an exclusive, even as to Swirled's, non-transferable, perpetual right and license in and to the Hashgraph technology for the limited and sole purpose of making Hedera's network a general purpose public ledger available to entities or individuals to use as developers, users, testers, and node operators. And now pay attention to this part. The MLA does not preclude Swirl from licensing its technology or providing services using the Hashgraph technology platform other than for the general purpose public ledger and specifically does not preclude Swirl from licensing its technology or providing services directly to governments or central banks for the purpose of central bank digital currencies. Y'all make me sick. Y'all make me sick. Does that not make you want to puke? So what this means at the end of the day is the HBAR Foundation has licenses to use this technology, but at the end of the day, it's owned by Swirled, who can then license the tech out to central banks without adding any value to the HBAR ecosystem. Now let me explain how validators work. I have a great mini series that teaches you guys about all of these topics in detail in my Kadena whiteboard mini series. This one blockchain is the holy grail of investing opportunities, and it's going to change every aspect of life as we know it. So. In DAGs and proof of stake blockchains, they replace miners with what are called validators. Validators are just like miners in proof of work blockchains, except for the fact that they can run validators on a $100 Raspberry Pi. They cost nothing to build, they cost nothing in electricity to run, and they almost never need to upgrade their equipment. So let's use Kevin O'Leary as an example. Most of you guys call him Mr. Wonderful. I call him Mr. Validator or Mr. Centralized. His company is running an HBAR validator which is why you see him promoting HBAR in almost every video. So if we pull up HBAR's governing council, you can see a list of companies and organizations who are running validators on HBAR. Remember, these are the people that are making all of the newly minted HBAR coins that are dumped out into circulation every month that depreciate the value of your investment. For example, here is a list of people running validators. Standard Bank, a banking and financial service across Sub-Sahara Africa. Number two, EDF, a top five global utility company. EDF is exploring the tokenization of renewable energy credits, RECs, carbon offsets and credit systems on Hedera through the Hedera token service. <laughs> Do personal carbon credit scores sound familiar? Gross. Number three, ETF POS, Australia's national debt operator. Now, if that wasn't good enough, how about IBM, Google, Verizon, T-Mobile, Shizan Bank, IFS? Do you see any retail investors on that list? They have what, like 39, 39 different parties running validators. Could you imagine if there was only 39 miners out there mining Bitcoin, trying to convince people that that's decentralized? So what that means is that every time you use the HBAR network and you pay fees to process your transaction, a percentage of those fees go to the validators that process your transaction, meaning the rich get richer. Is this some kind of sick joke? <laughs> Check this out. If we swing over to Masari, check out who's getting paid in HBAR every single day. Let's start from the beginning. On September 16th of 2019, HBAR had only released 1,589,617,895 coins out into circulation. Fast forward two years to the date on September 19th of 2021, HBAR put in a new all time high at 47 cents. At that point in time, there were over billion coins of HBAR released out into circulation, guys. That is an inflation rate of 387%. Let me break it down for you. At that point in time, 1,853,572,564 coins of HBAR were paid to the treasury, which is controlled by Swirl. 
2,392,408,688 coins of HBAR were paid to employees. 516,313,337 coins of HBAR were paid to advisors vendors aka people like kevin o'leary you are the ones who are the ball lickers and five billion four hundred and eight million one thousand five hundred fifty six coins of hbar were paid to SAF sales aka vcs and the smallest amount one billion two hundred and eight million three hundred and thirty three thousand three hundred and thirty three coins were paid to the community earned program rewards which means validators get paid bank aka those companies that we listed before and a tiny fraction of that actually went to retail investors who maybe staked their HBAR on a centralized exchange. I mean, I don't even really see the point of finishing this video, guys. So if I just add up those top four categories, you would see that 10,170,296,150 coins were somehow dumped out into the system, most likely to the richest of the rich, right? That means when HBAR put in its all-time high, the VCs, team members, and Ivory Tower elites could have dumped $4,780,039,190 worth of HBAR out into the open market, dumping on retail investors, probably without ever needing to touch any of their initial investment, which is just bonkers if you ask me, guys. If you ain't first, you're last. You know what I'm talking about? So I'll do some price predictions, but if it's not clear at this point, that HBAR is the most centralized DAG that only makes the rich richer. I mean, I won't even call it a cryptocurrency because it's not. It doesn't even deserve the right to call itself a cryptocurrency. Centralization at this level, a DAG that does nothing but make the rich richer while taking everything from the little guy should be laughed out of this industry. Please drop a comment below if you disagree and explain to me how a retail investor would benefit in investing in HBAR more than the suits and VCs. Frankly, I don't think you're my type. Out. Now remember, just over two years ago, HBAR had released 1.5 billion coins out into circulation. Today, the circulating supply of HBAR is 22,968,168,351. So over a two year period, the protocol depreciated the value of retail investors by increasing the max supply by 1,383%. And they still have another 27 billion coins that will be paid out to VCs, team members, central banks, and whoever's running those validators. Let's round to keep things simple. As of today, the price of HBAR is 6 cents. Circulating supply is 23 billion. Market cap is 1.4 billion. So let's round to keep it simple. If you invested in HBAR today and the price of HBAR is 6 cents and the market cap is 1.4 billion, for you to 2X on that investment and for the price of HBAR to hit 12 cents, the market cap would need to hit 2.8 billion. For you to 10x on that investment and for the price of HBAR to hit 60 cents, the market cap would need to hit 14 billion. For you to 20x on that investment and for the price of HBAR to hit $1.20, the market cap would need to be 28 billion. And for you to 100x on that investment and for the price of HBAR to hit $6, the market cap would need to be 140 billion. My best guess for HBAR going into the 2025 bull run would be around 30 cents peak. Best case. Oh. <laughs>